Halo 1 was a pretty good game. Not just gameplay-wise, I mean, it was fun. Halo 1 was fun. I think we spent years, frankly, at this point, saying how do we ratchet the bar across the board up for Halo 2? In a lot of ways, Halo 2 is just the, you know, an, an extension of all the excitement we felt at the end of Halo 1 and that we didn't get to, you know, that we didn't get to express. Just in every way, we've really increased the scale and the scope of the game. Exploring huge environments, 10 times the size of Halo 1. It's about kicking ass in as many ways as possible, in as many different bodies as possible. Halo 2 is about guns and mo guns. <laughs> That's what it's about. There's a lot of the story that we didn't get to tell. Boo! Kill the demon! There are characters that we had conceived of and even in some cases modeled. And it's also the same group of people too. And they all still want to do what they're doing. We want our game to look like a movie. We want it to look like something that's just unbelievable to experience. I guess we're sort of feeding off each other. So it's a, it's a really creative group of people that trust each other. The really important thing to do now is to, to take all these different disciplines who are all working on their own things and take all those pieces, take the AI code and the physics and the guys working on the, on the levels and bring all those pieces together at the same time. And then you keep doing that. You keep colliding things together until, uh, until it's a game. Grab it, grab it, grab it. Keep going, I got your back. No, not you, dude. Dude, get the back of the window. Hop in, hop in. Get out of the sword, get him. Keep it going, keep it going. This process began with the end of Halo and realizing all the stuff that we had left out. 
and Jason and I and Jamie and a few other people sitting down and thinking really hard about, oh, wow, what, what did we really want to tell? And, and then Jason locked himself in a room for a while and organized his core ideas and then came to me and said, hey, you know, these are my, these are my thoughts about a story for Halo 2. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know if we're crazy or stupid or uh, we just like good stories or, or what, but we, we certainly worry about that a lot more than you might think we'd have to in a game that's mostly just about action and, and about not thinking. In Halo 1, there was maybe 30 seconds of fun that happened over and over and over and over again. So if you can get 30 seconds of fun, you can pretty much stretch that out to be an entire game. Encountering a bunch of guys, melee attacking one of them before they were aware, throwing a grenade into a group of other guys, and then cleaning up the stragglers before they could surround you. And so you can have all the great graphics and all the different characters and lots of different weapons with amazing effects, but if you don't nail that 30 seconds, you're not gonna have a great game. This is the copy of the script, the cinematic script for Halo. This document needs to talk to programmers and artists and animators and everybody. This is 160 pages worth of cinematics. That's kind of crazy if you just think about it on its own. But when you look at a game which is 15 levels long and with a couple protagonists and a fairly complex story arc, I mean, when you need to drive the player's experience for 20 hours of gameplay, say, 120 minutes of cinematics doesn't really seem that out of proportion. But just to look at it prima facie, it's pretty daunting. You think, my God, you're making a feature film. Why was it not destroyed with the rest of their fleet? It fled as we set fire to their planet. But I followed with all the ships in my command. When you first saw Halo, were you blinded by its majesty? It's not about making it complex, and it's not about playing movies for you know, two hours in between every five minutes of gameplay, but the more you can make somebody believe that they're in this cool place, that they're on Halo fighting the Covenant instead of whatever, sitting in their, sitting in their living room at two in the morning trying to you know, finish some stupid video game. I will continue my campaign against the humans. There's a lot of complexity here up in this geometry, but look down now, there's very little of that down here. Oh, right. And I think we should try to flip-flop some of that. We start with the story, first of all. Uh, we, we get a good background to the entire game, just a foundation for things. And then we start building levels off of that. This particular level that I'm looking at right now is called the Sentinel Headquarters. The Sentinel is this hovering character they don't need floors. They, they can fly up through the ceilings. They can fly through portals that are 20 feet up. But you as the character will have the challenge of, of, of traversing this interesting terrain inside the structure up and across beam work and through these uh, little portals through the, throughout the space. So it's going to be really interesting for the player to explore. We made it, huh? Uh, all right, Michael's going to talk about the uh, engineering and stuff. It's, it's amazing to me how good stuff looks and how much progress we have, but it, something I've been thinking a lot about is E3. E3 uh, stands for the Electronic Entertainment Expo, and it's the biggest event in the video game world where all the developers and all the publishers and all the gaming press all get together for, it's almost a week long, uh, Carnival, practically. Trade shows are useful because they make you get your shit together. It's important for us to get excited about what we get done for E3 because we need to like, build that excitement up and go <laughs> God damn, we have a lot of work to do between now <laughs> and E3. I think, it's, I think it's really important to be ambitious. I think it's important to have more balls in the air that you can catch at the end when it all comes down to it and you have to ship a game. But certainly you can go too far. Of all the people on the team, Tyson and I are probably the people who are the most frightening for Jason and the programmers. We are the most crazy scripting, crack smoking, this would be so cool, damn the frame rate, let's pound the code and make these crazy things happen. E3 
demo from start to finish. Woohoo! They entered the city a little over an hour ago. <laughs> Yesterday, before the demo, we had all this stuff that we were just throwing in, and finally something began to catch, and we started moving. But all this stuff that didn't exist two hours earlier is all, all of a sudden in the demo and ready to show to people. That's when it's the most rewarding and most fun to be doing this sort of stuff, is when it, it clicks. So you will continue fighting. Uh, I don't think this part of the script is going to work, but at some point, you and your ODST buddies will jump down, and you'll have two SMGs at this point, one in each hand, and you will begin to tear into the grunts with your two SMGs. A lot of things that you see at E3 are movies so that they can kind of fake the sound or, you know, uh, pre-render it even so that their frame rate is solid. But what we're doing is we're playing it in front of people live. The sign will come crashing down onto the dropship. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> the Master Chief will be chased by brutes and this is all f***ed up and horrible, but... <laughs> and then all of a sudden another shadow of a dropship passes over you. And Cortana says, oh lord, look out! Look out! Because it's raining roots, baby! <laughs> This is for a scene where the brute jumps down onto the hood of the Warthog, surprising the drive um, for Joe's demo at E3. We always want to try to put a, you know, a bit of ourselves in the character. Um, it's at least what I'm trying to do with the, with the brute as well. We've been playing around with the idea of characters boarding other vehicles. Um, so here you see a cycle of the brute swatting the driver and the passenger out of the way. It's a pretty rough cycle. It's about 70% complete. Still got a lot more work to put into it. What we are doing now for animation is so much more in depth. We're bringing so much more character to each one of the uh, entities in our game. So creating an environment that is visually compelling and beautiful from all vantage points is such a huge challenge. Look how cool that weapon is. This group of people is is great. I'm some, sometimes pretty awestruck by, you know, how whatever how smart these people really are and how good decisions that they're really making. Yeah, I'm really proud of those guys. Okay, we should try it. The, just that scene where the chief ejects out the tunnel door now, which was never slow before, is now but slow. But slow. Okay. Right. Everybody here, they work really, really hard, and it doesn't take that, that pressure to get them to jump it up to the next level. Jason, help. I think we should find a different way to do that, because the whole f***ing Pelican was generating these immense shadow volumes that were sure. filling your screen with this giant f bomb. We are the most cynical that, people. Like, we are the jaded crowd who, if a game doesn't entertain it in five minutes, we stop playing it. Oh, no. What? This light is, like, world relative, isn't it? Yes. I'm What I had hoped to achieve in about a half hour, now I'm looking at a good night's worth. So, yeah, hopefully by tomorrow morning, we'll have something that works. The Pelican is so expensive. That's what the shadow has. A small group of people who, as you work to the very, very end, are going to sit down and feed off that adrenaline and fix the really nitty gritty details and ship the really totally polished thing. Oh, that's got to hurt. There it is. Oh, no! What's that? From what above? is that? It's a new thing. <laughs> we're just, just throwing everything we can at it. And, you know, Joe keeps uh, pushing for more and more, and then the pro programmers will come through with some spectacular thing, and then the particle effects guy. And, will, you know, create something that just looks beautiful, but then the frame rate goes down, and the frame rate goes down, and my music is no longer in sync. Oh, oh, oh. There it is. Huh? Bet you can't stick it. Bet you can't stick it. Oh, you're on. What was that? That's something, something for the fans. I like that. Yeah, that was that's the first that's for that. the uh, 
the little uh, glowy. That's for the really hardcore, name. like German press corps. <laughs> like up to that point, went, oh, you do not oh. believe it's good. And now they're like, wow. <laughs> The most important thing is what comes out of this E3. It's uh, For all the business reasons, this is an important moment for retailers in terms of making their decisions on the games they're going to get behind. And it's also really important to the fans, and I think this is a great moment for them to see you know, what this game really could be like. We've been pretty quiet about what we've been doing. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think fans are coming in with no expectations, right? no preconceived notions about what they're going to see. show you Halo 2 today. Uh, this is a... I'm actually going to be playing it as best I can. Um, but before we start, I just need to go over some safety regulations in case of uh, fire or electrical storm or earthquake or something like that. Just be sure that you guys are safe. Snow it, son! These folks didn't wait in line to hear your lips flippity flap. Knuckle up and get ready to dance, you pasty bastard! Yes, sir, Sergeant! <laughs> What you good people are about to see is an operation in progress. This is a real-time feed. No smoke and mirrors pre-recorded bullshit. <laughs> have made landfall and occupied one of our cities. We will link up with our forces in theater, engage the enemy, and boot their side behind back into the stratosphere. <laughs> Uh, sir. Uh, you got anything? Well, I, I need to talk about the... So. Kill the lights! <laughs> 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 out! Go, go, go! Take my weapon. You'll need it. Thanks a lot for coming, everybody. Good show. I mean, when I'm watching the demo and you climb up on the cruiser and kick the guy off, I lost it. Master Chief jumped up the uh, ghost, kicked the enemy down and got on it. It was over. It was game over after that. Jumping on the ghost definitely surprised everyone yeah. the first time. I was yeah. like, hey. Because yeah. everybody remembers getting run over by those things. Uh, you blow something up and the guy crawls out and he's still alive, I mean. 
It doesn't get much better than that as far as I'm concerned. It seemed like a war, like a real battle. I have to see it twice just to make sure that it wasn't the exact same thing and it was totally different this time. I don't say the word awesome. Usually dude doesn't come out of my mouth. But the truth is, the game is awesome, dude. How the hell are we going to beat this game? <laughs> hey, let's hurry it up. Let's get it out of here. No, you know, we can't wait another year. You know, no. I'm sorry. We can't wait. This game has to come out now. Yeah. day in, day out, indoors under fluorescent bulbs, slaving away. This is the first sun we've seen in months. If you look, you can see just by our, our, our bulk and our musculature that we're not only top-notch game developers, we're also star athletes. Okay, everyone! Pathlon is uh, five, five uh, different sports. We split up into four teams. Grizzled Ancients, which right. are the cool people. Um, it's oh, like tenure. It's like tenure. So yeah, how long have you been a bunch of terms which team you're on? Old school, middle school, and newbies. And Grizzled Ancients, of which I am not a Grizzled Ancient. Five of them. Tug of War, the old classic that everybody hates, right? right. So you end up with red hands. <laughs> Volleyball, dodgeball, bocce ball, uh, wacky race. And tug of war. Let me tell you the secret to tug of war. The team with me as the anchor isn't gonna win. The team with Michael as the anchor, well, they got a shot. <laughs> the team with Nathan over there as the anchor, they got a real good shot. <laughs> Everybody's gotta start with both uh, bum cheeks on the line. Apparently the, your team is like the flood. You were all one body and one mind. This game is about throwing balls and hitting other people. Great honor. <laughs> no hug. <laughs> 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 Death line for 2003 is officially done. I'm enjoying the sunset, the last sort of rays of light, because uh, the next five months or so, I don't think we're all going to see very much sun. As a matter of fact, I don't think we're going to see any sun at all for the next five or six months, so enjoy it while it lasts. We had a vision in our mind about what Halo 2 would look like, and that vision is really easy to see in the Halo 2 announcement trailer. You know, stencil shadows on everything, uh, real-time reflections in the Master Chief's visor, this very crisp, well-wrought image. And we thought, well, that's what we're going to show for E3. And when we got to the actual implementation of some of the choices we had made, we realized that it's impossible. And we went around and around on that and other questions for perhaps too long. I don't think anybody in this world has e ever done anything worthwhile without being their own worst critic. I think that, I mean, especially when you talk about any creative enterprise, if you somehow believe that what you're doing is the greatest thing ever all the time, it's absolutely not gonna be the greatest thing ever. We came back with E3 with actually less than what we wanted to. We came back from E3 with a demo. We did not come back from E3 with a playable part of a level.
That was really bad, actually. That wasn't the goal. What E3 gave us was the sense that we still didn't have uh, the target that we were aiming at. So after E3, instead of being able to jump into all of our levels and go right into it, we're still trying to figure out where we're going and what the quality bar is going to be. Because right now, the game is not fun. That is if I have time with all you bastards making me fix things. We've got 50, 60 guys now on the Halo 2 team. They're waiting to be told, hey, what do we do? You know, what do we as this massive, smart, talented, hardcore devoted guys that are going to stay up really late, what, what do we do? Tell us. We want to do it. I do these land fests like every every six months or so. Some of the people that are showing up are are regulars. There's always new people. It's just Halo ties it all together. All right, hi, I'm Blackstar. Yes, Black Star. Uh, yeah, the one you know and love. Cyber Freak. Cyber Freak. Cyber Freak. Arizona. Cyber. That's Shishka. I'm Shishka. Nice hey. to meet you all. Uh, Mr. Sacrament. Smiley. Yeah, Mr. Smiley. Brian from Bungie. We got someone yeah. from Bungie here. Yeah, that's right. Oh. 35, 40 people here, and they're all about Halo, and they all post on these online forums, and they're all like these these internet beings that like we finally get to shake hands with. Oh, oh, they're running across. They're across. They're everywhere. There's like 14 of them inside the base. Right now, we have this game going here, which is 16. Downstairs, I was just down there. They probably by now have at least a 16 game going on. They keep on bringing in more stuff, and it seems to be expanding. We set up 10 Xboxes, actually. That meant 10 TVs or screens of some sort. It turned out we had four LCD projectors. All of the wiring in the house runs into one room and into a pair of switches and then goes out again. All running off my house in the Connecticut suburbs in the winter. People willing to spend next month's rent to fly across the country to play in a game at my house. Got the flag, I'm out the front! Oh, that's oh, that's playing offense. Oh my god! What it comes down to is getting together with people and being able to yell at them. Being able to, you know, talk about, oh, it was so great when you killed me with that rocket, I didn't even know it was coming, you know? Shishka's aim is poor on the train! Sorry. Oh my god. Being able to like reflect on the gameplay afterwards. Blue team got the most captures. I got the most kills. So I get one of the prizes. Uh... Dolbeck got most kills, and then Kingpin got one death because he just sat around like a pansy. But if he's watching this, he's a pansy. He knows. <laughs> what do you mean? It's not that his moist thing down here. It's like time on bunch of players growing. They probably think we're a little strange. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Well, a, little, a little? A little. It's a hobby Why? like any other, and and every hobby has its own. A uh, level of obsession or, or a level of interest. We're a social group getting together. <laughs> Gaming used to be the domain of the geeks, and it's not really anymore. I got the flag. You got it? Oh shit, maybe not. I got it. Are we too old? I got it. Oh, I have to to me. Nah. To Halo 2? To Halo 2. And Bungie. And Bungie. What do I do? I make guns. You get that butt in, use it like a pistol, and you'll be able to have one in both hands. So you walk around with these two bullet hoses. There's the battle rifle, right? If you're like me, uh, <laughs> it'll be the weapon that you, you fall back on throughout the entire game. Because it's the go-to gun. It'll hopefully actually behave more like a rifle than, uh, than the assault rifle did from, from Halo, which was more of a submachine gun. 
it suffered from the same things that all video game weapons suffer from, and that is they do not behave like their real, real world counterparts. South Carolina, it was a trip for uh, reference um, to see basically how Marines moved, how they reacted in combat situations, formations. We show up on a farm and we're kind of like, hmm, how serious could these guys actually be? And then we turn the corner and see a table full of guns. Not only one table, but two picnic tables full of guns. Actual military issue service weapons. It ranged from pistols to machine guns, fully automatic, silenced. You're talking the deadliest type of guns. And these guys were pretty serious. Uh, it was kind of intimidating. Gun comes up, gun bang, doesn't bang. work. And now I'm gonna take up a good shooting position and I'm gonna fall him all the way into the ground. Try to take him down. If I just barrel point him like that. During the development now of Halo, stuck. whatever, we'd made mistakes. We definitely got some criticism from actual people that were in the military. We had a smaller team, right? And, and we had a very short time to make the game. We did a lot of, a lot of research, uh, but there's only so much that books can teach you. Um, you've got to get a lot of research hands on. It isn't very often where you get to see guys who really know what they're doing. And it's full extension. Now you're holding it out here by itself. Being able to stand back and observe brass ejecting from, from the weapon and... The most surprising thing for me was basically the communication between the two-man unit. Moving! Move! Touching your partner's back when he's in front of you. Marines going into combat formations, how they'd handle certain situations, how they'd handle multiple opponents, single opponents. We're trying to, to go far and above what we've done in Halo 1. This is our audio playground, which has evolved greatly since the last time. We now have virtually every surface in the game in these large rooms that allow us to kind of mess around and do what we want. Let me show you to one of my favorite rooms, which is the dirt room. Awful lot of dirt in Halo. I could listen to this stuff all day. A voice is a point in space that is creating audio, and that audio gets mixed and then gets put out the speakers. If I turn on one more debug thing here, it'll actually show us how just how many voices are in use for an event like this. So the screen is filled with the amount of sound calls we're getting. And what this is telling us right here is that we have about 17 or 18 voices in use when this chain gun is firing. And we can have 64 unique things happening in, in surround sound space at a time. We are matrix of doom because the amount of surface types that we have in the game versus the amount of objects that we have in the game colliding with each other and against the environment we will be generating hundreds and indeed thousands of, of sound effects to try to cover up this, this matrix. There's nothing we can't put in the game and all we're waiting for is the assets to go in there for us to tag to them. So we're in good shape, I think. Now ask me again in two months and, and when I'm bloodshot eyes and I haven't bathed in three days and I'll probably tell you something different. So we had a game that was, um, that was nine levels um, took us, started at Earth and brought us out into the galaxy and then brought us back to Earth for this grand conclusion. Well, right about at that moment, Pandora's box was opened and decisions which were engraved in stone were rethought. We messed up, like we didn't have the design down, we didn't have the story down. Once we actually started to see how long the missions were taken to to produce and how long they were taking to design and script and it, it just it just wasn't going to work. And then everything that wasn't essential, all these things that we just loved to see in the game, they all they get put on the bottom of this list and we end up start we start hacking them off. Here comes the knife out of the script. What's important that isn't, you know, goodbye my lovely child. The bungee process of making cool games has worked up until now, but is it possible that there's an amount of pressure or, or an ambition that's beyond what we can actually do? 
I don't know. It's, it's, we haven't finished it yet. These levels behind me, they are commitment, these whiteboards. All they are is commitment. This is what we're going to do. The time for constructive feedback is done, and it's time to work. Have you paid attention to our enemies for one second? I beg your pardon? First of all, that guy, he's not yellow. He's orange. And since when is there a girl on the red team? My favorite thing is pretty dresses. Arr. I got termites in me leg. And that is not a southern accent. Arr. Do you have any tampons? Seriously, what is the matter with you people? At the time we started the series, we thought we were the first people ever to do this. <laughs> we, did. we thought we, we were, we thought we were such creative yeah. geniuses. We made two little five-minute... No, they were about what, two minutes no, back were about then. Two about minutes. two minutes apiece. Yeah, yeah, two minutes each, and we put them on the web, and they were just funny little sketches that we wrote, and then we used uh, Halo to animate them. All right, O'Malley, this is it. I got half a mind to kill you, That's ridiculous. and the other half agrees. I think the first week we had 2,000 hits, and then we had, I think, 3,000 hits in a day, and so we realized it was kind of starting to take off, and then the next day we had 50,000 hits, and uh, so we started doing a weekly series pretty quickly. This is the M12 LRV. I like to call it the Warthog. A lot of the jokes are just things that you and your buddies would say to each other while you're playing Halo. Why Warthog, sir? Because M12 LRV is too hard to say in conversation, son. Uh, is Simmons in the can? I'm ready. Okay. Action. Would Electrified be okay? Would Electrified be okay? Hmm. Would Electrified be okay? Great. Well, as you can tell, we are in uh, the old closet for this bedroom out here. You still, we still have the wooden bars where you'd be hanging your clothes. When's it gonna be Simmons' turn? When? When I do the yelling, I hold on to the bars up here where we hang the clothes from. Otherwise, I get a little too excited. That's pretty good, but try to sound like you're reading it off a script. All right, I can do that. Get, get through it a little faster. OK. Aw, oh, come on, Griff. He was more of a bag than a douchebag. I'm wearing a training bra. I'm wearing a training bra. Try emphasizing I'm. <laughs> There's a really weird feature in Halo. I won't, I won't call it a bug, out of respect. The position a character is normally in when playing the game, they have their gun up, they're looking around for somebody else going to shoot them, and then as you lower the gun, the character looks down, but at the last minute there, looks back up. And we can make them bob their head to talk, to show who's talking, movement. We can have them turn to face people. Ah! Well, looks like Caboose has hurt himself. This is the bug that makes it possible. You know, we, if without this, we couldn't do it. It's a beautiful game. I mean, there's still, I don't think there's a better looking game for the Xbox since it's come out. No, I'd, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to keep doing it basically as long as Bungie and the fans will put up with us. We're here today. We're on the 8th of June today. We're roughly halfway towards finishing the project since this went up. So four weeks from now, we'll have coded everything in the game. Another four weeks from now, we'll have put all of the pieces of content in the game. Two weeks after that, we'll have literally everything, all of the audio, all the cinematics, everything. Then there's six weeks after that where all we do is play it and we fix any bug where we absolutely could not ship it. And then we release it. I'm just kind of scared shitless right now, to be honest with you. Problem is, the bug I have is... The difference between good enough and awesome is, is, is so big and I mean, there's this, this, this standard set by everyone here that, I mean, good enough sucks. You can't do good enough. You fire the bullet, and the bullet comes about maybe four or five pixels below where uh, the crosshair says it's going to. It's, it's, a, it's a hard kind of thing to live up to, but it's, uh, I mean, the game's going to be better for it. We're actually pretty good at slamming stuff in right at the end. As a matter of fact, I think we do some of our best work that way. We're seeing big chunks of the game being being fun and playable, and so I think I think that's a huge corner that we've turned. Uh, right now, I'm working on polishing the blood splatter decals. The 
bugger evolved into uh, this model right here. He has independent little hips, which kind of give him buggery movement, which is cool. We're trying to add certain specific weak points to a Banshee, so, like on the anti-grav pods on the wings. We've got a huge amount of, of work to do in this very, very compressed time period. That's scary. These guys, are, are, everybody here is scared. More time would be well done. CJ doesn't need this until. If we could have some more time, that would be great, but the fans are screaming. More time, more time. Yeah, we could have used a lot more time. If you can invent a 75-hour day, you'd be my best friend. We're not asking to work shorter days. We're asking to work as hard as we're working right now, but just two weeks. It's an amazing thing to be part of. That many people want something so bad that they're willing to spend that, you know, that time and that effort seven days a week. It's tremendously hard. It's a cool thing to be part of, and Halo 1 wouldn't have been what it was if we hadn't done that, and this game sure wouldn't be what it is going to be if we had worked eight hours a day, and maybe that sucks because we didn't plan right, and maybe there's a way to do it all on the nine to five schedule, and maybe one day we'll even find that, but it's sure not the way it's going to be this time. We've undertaken this really massive task. I think that we had two or 3,000 lines of unique combat dialogue in Halo 1. Now we're talking more than 14,000 lines of combat dialogue. So the end result is that Marty and I are spending, Marty more than me, a bunch of time in the studio getting a lot of voices. Let's see, fairly robust security algorithms. I could crack them, but sidestep, cover my tracks, and voila, top side hull schematics. See, Jen, you just made like all the dorky techno geeks. That... <laughs> There's nothing hotter than a woman that can infiltrate top side hull schematics. <laughs> What's it like working with Marty? That's a good question. Joe? Oh, well, I mean, it's the best. Working with Marty is an effort in patience and restraint hilarious, he's funny, he's sharp. He gets to bitch like nobody's business about how much work he has and how little time there is. We work together really well. He's The two of us together are the most unlikely couple for a variety of reasons. He, um, I hate him, actually. <laughs> Chief, whatever you're going to do, make it quick. I think Cort Cortana might just be genuinely... Basically, well, all you want to do is say, genuinely... louder, faster. Now you're sad. But Joe is like, well, you see, back in the first centuries of space flight, the Covenant. So, right, the Covenant fleet, which arrived at Earth, is now attacking. There's and an engine core, and if we destroy the reactor, the power's the core of the ship. Appearing. Actually, I can see the actor's eyes start to glaze over. They have no idea what that means. So they'll say, so you want it faster? And then I'll go, yeah, faster. <laughs> I'd say Marty's direction is incredibly intuitive. Sometimes, and, and, and I'm smiling even as I say it, I don't know what I'm going to say, but Marty does, and he's already written out exactly as I'm going to say it. Oh, pod! I'm an alien! <laughs> we lost! It's raining aliens! <laughs> oh, Jesus, why you do this to me? <laughs> aliens everywhere! <laughs> Number one, you want to have someone who gets it, who, if they've, especially if they've played the game or if they're really good actors and they've improvised a lot. That's the kind of performance we're looking for. I just don't want the actor to blow through the page and give me exactly what I want. I want the actor to go through the page, give me what I want, be inspired, and then launch off into some crazy realm. Hello, I am 343 Guilty Spark. I am the monitor of Installation 04. This will save me from the storm but you will be consumed. The universe is full of cold, hard facts, and this is one of them. Chief, we've got a problem. The boarding craft from the Malta and the Athens are converging on us. The moment of salvation is at hand. Forward, warriors, and fear not pain or death. I shall light this holy ring, release its cleansing flame, and burn a path into the divine beyond. <clears throat> This place is falling apart. Kill me or release me, Parasite. But do not waste my time with talk. I need a weapon. This is not your grave. <laughs> but you are welcome in it. Kill the other. I have come to kill you. 
on your shoulders, Chieftain. That was really wonderful to see these actors come in who we really didn't know what was going to happen with them, and they, they worked really, really hard, and they did a really great job. Works for us, and away we go. Wee! If only Marty would work that hard, we'd be set. Dia tat. Dia pop. There's always a point like when I'm all by myself composing, and this just happened like within the last 24 hours, where I'm thinking, is this anything? Is this idea gonna be interesting to anybody? You have these whole series of self-doubts, and then there comes a point where I get over the hump. Like I add some instrument or I play some melody, and it's like, oh, oh okay, that's what this was meant to be. If I'm involved in the development of the game and I actually enjoy the game and I'm talking with Joe and I'm talking with Tyson, I'm understanding emotionally what they're trying to do, then my product will be better because I'm that deeply involved in it. Marty's pretty amazing. Marty makes uh, pretty much everything we do twice as good and that makes me really angry because he's just about the only individual who has that level of contribution to the team, but I would never say that to him. It's really nice to see something which needed an epic effort to put it together and make it really great sort of coming together now. We're at a stage in the game development where a lot of things that were broken or unfinished are really coming together. wiped out all my expectations. I was hoping for Halo 1.5 or 6, you know, and a few new features, a couple of new weapons, but just seeing how it's exploding, it's, it's really incredible. It's really great to have this deadline that we can't move at all because it forces us to kind of finish it. When the producers come over and pry our hands from the keyboard and say, OK, you can't touch it anymore. We, we've got to start manufacturing these discs. I think that's the point where we're going to have to stop, and that's going to be the end of it. People are like, god damn, like, it's so cool to fight the hunter, except then this grunt guy came over. And wouldn't it be cool like if he could jump up on the hunter's back and do this or that or, you know, whatever? And they're like, go do it. It feels to me like the excitement is coming back. Getting the missions together is, is pretty huge. It's something that people haven't seen for three years. All the designers are here, programmers are here, environment artists seem like they haven't gone home since about April anyway, so I think everybody's kept focused, and I, I think that's, that's something that's really important. We're seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel, so that's good. There's glorious, bright light at the end of the tunnel. I see the light, it's this little pinprick, but it's coming fast. I'm married to the guy who actually got to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and he says it's glorious. <laughs> Hello, 
Every day I see something brand new that it blows me away. I'm like, gosh, how did you guys do that? It's really neat stuff. It excites me, makes me do better work, makes all these other guys do better work. They're really excited about it. Jason has this phrase that he uses for how things come together at the end, and it, he says that it's like assembling a cathedral out of a hurricane. We scale each of these three factors by a different value. The best part of working Halo 1 was at the end when the game's done, and you, and you come in and play the game, and you know, you, that's your work. You come in and you actually beta test the game, and I'll just tell him that I can't wait to do that. I can't wait to see all the work that we've done, put it in the game, and play it at the end of the game. It's just, it's gonna be awesome. I would describe it as barely pulling out of the dive in time to make a perfect three-point landing. And I think we're, we're, every, every, if the plane holds together, we're gonna land it okay. I'm often amazed by the shit that we can pull off. This group of people is, is great. Well, I think you... It's about, believing you're the best and that there's nothing that you can't overcome. Um, it's about showing everybody else that you're, that you rule the world. And uh, it's also about having fun. I mean, as hard as it gets, it's still the best <laughs> job in the world. Come on. All right, <laughs> stick together. Right now. Oh, it went up top. I should murder Max. Kind of, uh, a little bit. I like to think of it as jumping out of an airplane with some silkworms and a needle and having to make your parachute on the way down. Um, it always comes together right at the very end. Pull this out from so far. There's always this thing that happens at the end where all these disparate pieces come together and make this glorious game and to a certain extent you just have to keep your hands on the keyboard like it's a steering wheel of a race car and type really quickly as all this stuff falls into the hopper because very quickly what's going to come out the other side is I think something which is really good. We're not sure yet but it's looking it's looking like it's going to be good. We've got a problem. I will continue my campaign against the humans. Stand by to... Whoa. The story of Halo 2 is, it's the story of Halo 1 told from the Covenant perspective. Halo's story is one about salvation. It's a story of warriors with not a lot of options who have their backs up against the wall. How much further must we have to this baggage? In Halo 1, we focused on the human's perspective, their fate. Uh, at the hands of the Covenant, but we never really got too much into the Covenant side of the story itself. Arbiter is a real challenge to the story because he's he's not the chief, he's not human. As the player at the start of the game, you don't realize that you're actually going to play this elite general who's been disgraced, but you get this quick glimpse at, ah, oh, that's the flip side of what happened to the Covenant at the end of the first game. Halo's destruction was your era and you rightly bear the blame. But ultimately, the terms of your execution are up to me. I am already dead. A couple levels into the game, you realize, oh my god, I get, I get to play this guy. People identify with humans. People care about humans more. So we really have to, we really have to put the Arbiter in a position in the story where he matters and where the player cares about him. You want to look at this guy and you want to see that, wow, he's, he's just as cool as the Master Chief. What would you have your arbiter do? 
this time around, it, it's essentially we're, we're telling two stories that simultaneously. We're, we're going back and forth from level to level. Way over 90% of the time, there's going to be the player who's not paying any attention to the story. He's writing his own story. He's going to do, he's, it's basically just an action movie. That's really a challenge in a game. Like when you stop the game and give the, and give the player your dose of the story and you've succeeded when he's not thinking of those two things as, as different anymore. What we are doing now in Halo 2 is so much more in depth. Is we're bringing so much more character to each one of the uh, entities. For the sacred icon has been found. With it, our path is clear, our entry into the divine beyond guaranteed. This new character here is the Prophet. They wanted some guy who is um, omnipotent looking and, you know, really powerful. Uh, looks like, but really old and fragile. Prophets are the ultimate bad guy. Were it not for the Arbiters, the Covenant would have broken long ago. In Halo 2, we are really making a bigger effort to give each one of those characters their more animalistic behavior, something that's more true to the actual character themselves. He's just this big, brutish guy who is just, you could probably equate him to, you know, a really badass biker you met in a bar and crossed the wrong way. Brute is a more of a combination of a gorilla type like face and he's got a skin of a pachyderm. The Mohawk. We were trying to think of a way to distinguish the Tartarus from uh, the rest of the pack. And the uh, main bad guy in Gremlins 2 had a giant white Mohawk. And that worked extremely well. Everybody realized, you know, who, who was the boss. So I like him. I like him a lot. I think he's a cool character. I think Tartarus is someone who you really will, at the beginning, trust a little bit, but then end up end up loathing. And I think putting a bullet in his head is going to be extremely satisfying for people. Now would be a very good time to leave. The chief was extremely robotic in Halo 1. I've made him a much more, not sappy, emotional character, but show some cracks in his armor. Um, explain a little bit more about his relationship with Cortana. I apologize, but we're going to have to make this quick. You look nice. Thank Thanks. you. And his relationship with another character, Miranda, who we're introducing, the daughter of Captain Keys from the first game. Commander Miranda Keys. This is a much more human story. Smile. What's it? Well, we still got something to smile about. Master Chief, pretty much the consummate professional. Does his job walks off, doesn't even get the girl, he's that cool. He doesn't need her. Your pal, where's he going? This game's about making a hero of everybody who picks it up. I'm really excited about the moment where the player puts down the controller and, and says, oh man, that was so awesome. I just beat the crap out of him. We're going in. Get tactical, Marine. And it's just fun, it's a great universe. I mean, I don't know if I'd want to live there, but it's fun to visit. Oh, I know what the ladies like. Stay down. The loss of one of the sacred rings racked our hearts with grief. Putting aside our sorrow, we renewed our faith in the prophecy that other rings would be found and see how our faith has been rewarded. Halo. In Halo 2, we've got a much bigger story to tell, and this story takes place in a lot of different places. We're going to send the player on this galactic romp from the ruins of Halo to the Prophet's homeworld, High Charity, to these amazing forerunner facilities in the atmospheres of planets. The player is going to transition from mission to mission from one unexpected place to the next. There is no doubt the storm will strike the facility. We start out with, with a sheet of paper and just try to generate ideas. What are, what are the cool things that could happen on this mission? We'll bang our heads against the whiteboard and we'll call each other assholes and that's crazy and we can't do that before we cobble together some unified plan which is going to work for the entire level. There's all this sort of high level stuff when you get into building it, you gotta have good encounters. 
You gotta have good arcing fiction on a three to five encounter basis. At some point, you'll get a surprise twist that sends you off in a different direction, and then it's got a really cool finale. Oracle, what is Halo's purpose? It's building an encounter that always keeps people thinking. It's a pretty big challenge. Is there anything actually going on in the room before I get there? Are guys just sort of patrolling? Is there another fight going on? You know, or Flood gonna bust through? There's a lot of tricks you try and employ. We, I mean, we want the player to feel like they're choosing to go in a direction even when we're forcing them to. We guide the player with texture, with lighting, um, with AI, with sound. We obviously want to make it so that there are multiple paths through this space. Every single one of those areas had to be modeled by an artist. I mean, there's someone went in there, and for every single wall you see, every single floor, every single light, every single you know piece of glass, like there was an artist there. Someone had to go through and make all that. What I like most about Halo is that we don't build encounters and our AI doesn't act in a way that is very predictable. So AI stands for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is simply the discipline that tries to simulate intelligent processes. What we're literally doing is taking these characters and we're writing a piece of software that acts as their brain. It really is all about when this happens, do this. When this other thing happens, do this. That's a lot where like the designers and, the, and artists step in is, is deciding well, we have all this cool technology, how are we going to use it and uh, how are you going to create this experience that, that the player can understand, you know, that, that when, you know, he sees a certain type of thing that if he shoots it, it's going to blow up and he's going to destroy it and pass through it. Most of the Halo world is not destructible. You have to walk a, a fine line in deciding what things are going to be destructible and what's going to match the player's expectations for what's destroyable. When someone says, hey, the whole world is destructible, that, that's great. We've done our job. We've, we've made them believe that. So that kind of thing really excites me, is being able to create a real environment and not take shortcuts and not fake things and actually just get in there and really try to make it a real place and a real exciting place for, for people to go. If you can set it up so that each new situation is the problem that the player has to solve, like he can do that over and over and over again. All the events that we're trying to create we just want people to feel like they're the only ones in the context of this game that could do what they're doing. It's all about you saving the universe again. I think the days are gone where the guys say, you know, honey, I'm going over to Jeff's house to go play cards. Now it's, honey, I'm headed over to Jeff's house to go play Halo. <laughs> Multiplayer is a little different because it's more like a sport in that you're, you know, yes, the game is there, but it's basically helping you compete against your friends. <laughs> you essentially get to rage against each other in this crazy combat world. It's always fresh. Your opponents are always new and they are always adapting. Super addictive. We played it every single night for one year. Go, go, go. We actually kind of went out on a limb with Halo 2. We designed each one of our multiplayer maps so they fit within the single player settings. Um, so you could look at any of our maps and you could say, wait, I, I know that location. Probably the most popular team game types is Capture the Flag. We're on almost every Halo 1 map. We had two bases that were pretty identical. And at the beginning of Halo 2, we were trying to think of different ways where we can make our maps more asymmetrical. It's fun to play as the attacker, and then it's fun to play as the defender. You can never completely defend the base. Maybe there's two guys defending, but there's three ways in. You're always having to make these choices. So the attackers start on the beach. And we give the attacker a warthog and two ghosts. And then we don't give the defender anything except the rocket launcher and the beach is separated 
from the main complex by the seawall. So it gives the attackers a home, and then the defenders also have their base, which is their home. And then the vehicles have to come in through this one gate. The rocket launcher guy usually likes to get into position to attack that gate. The HUD is the heads-up display. Let's say I'm in a firefight and I'm firing my weapon, and if I'm taking damage, the indicator turns red, so I can instantly see if my teammates are in trouble. And if one of them was to die, my friend there is dead. He shows up with a big red X over his head. Now, there's been many times I've been in a game, and I'll be following my buddies right into go get the flag, and then all of a sudden, I'll see all these red X's appear on my screen. I'll go, you know, maybe now is not a good time to run through that door. Everybody likes to go to their buddy's house and, you know, order pizza and get something to drink and wipe the Cheetos off your hands and jabbing each other and calling them names. What we wanted to do was take that whole situation and bring it to Xbox Live. And so we tried to create what we call the virtual couch. We tried something completely new, which is this party system, where you and your friends kind of combine together online. And you can jump from game to game to game to game and you and your friends will always be together. You suck, man. Watch your back, watch your back, watch your back. It was really amazing to get online for the first time when there were a bunch of people online and just press the button that said, I want to play, go find me some other people that want to play and choose a game type that's pretty cool and just stick me in it as fast as you can. And to have that process happen in like five seconds was really, was really incredible. Guy in our base, go up rocket man. Raphael, man, find someone. <laughs> Proximity voice. You can get close to somebody in a game and talk to them, and only that person can hear you. <laughs> nice grenade toss, though. Proximity voice is going to make us gods. There's nothing like running up to somebody and killing them with the energy sword, and then two minutes later they kill you, and then they're standing over your body saying, Eat it! How did you like that? See, this is my sword! <laughs> You're just an anonymous nobody, unless we build ways for you to create an identity for yourself there. We allow them to customize their color, their player emblem, so that when they go online, I'm the little red smiley face. And so if people see my red smiley face and they go, hey, I remember that guy. My clan is a group of guys that form a team. And we may practice. We may uh, join one of these matchmaking playlists. It's hard to play with people that are lower skill level than you, even if you really like them, because you're probably going to lose more often, and you're not going to have as much fun. If I play with Chris, the two of us are ranked together as a, as a team, and if he's not as good as me, then that's going to take down your rank. The point is, Chris sucks. Flag drop. Oh my god! Oh my god. Because Carney was no good. One of the cool things we're working on is integrating the live functionality of the game with the, the website, and we're kind of going to be a, a starting point for your, your Halo 2 bragging rights. Other really cool things about map analysis or statistics on kills and weapons killed with that we may or may not get to, depending on how tired I get between now and September. If we do this right, if we are able to really pull off the engine and Xbox Live and the social community, it, it's going to destroy everything else that's out there. There is something so magic. It's like being an athlete in a sporting event. Nice, nice, yeah, nice. The rush that you get when you're about to win and your heart starts going boom, 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 boom. Sniper, sniper! Oh, yeah. You know you're going to just almost get it to score. You just assist it. And then somebody snipes you from the corner. Ah. And you jump up and scream and throw your controller down. And <laughs> You hate it, but you love it, and you got to play again. <laughs> I'm Joseph Staten. I'm the director of cinematics. I basically am in charge of making the movies, telling the story. I'm CJ Cowan. I am a cinematic designer. John Buckus, animator. This is a scene that used to happen in the middle of the control room level where the Arbiter comes across Sergeant Johnson basically about to be executed by some brutes. This one will do. Kill the other. Yes, Chieftain. A day's rations says I do this in one cut. Ugh. 
Two cuts, at least. You're on. This was gonna be sort of our big, crazy fight scene that John and I cooked up, and John did most of wow. the good choreography for it. And then, uh, then we decided to simplify things. I don't know, what would you add to that, John? Uh, how do you mean simplify? By, by cutting it? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> by saying, this is stupid. No, I think if you, if you watch it, you'll see that there's just a ton of really great uh, yeah. action, which I think oh, ultimately I decided yeah. one was really hard to animate given the time that we had. So it was a fight scene that we wanted the player to actually do himself. Yeah. Yeah. I always wanted to have some big rumble between the uh, Arbiter and a bunch of the Broods. You don't really ever see these guys go at it unarmed, and this would be the one great situation where you see, look at that, whoop, ah, look at that choreography, oh, in the face. There's still a small part of this cinematic that is in the game. We still have the, basically the end of this cinematic where the Arbiter and Johnson are, um, talking about what they're going to do, how they're going to actually make it to the control room to take out Tartarus. We wanted to get Johnson safely into the scare before the player could get control of things. And that's that's what actually happens in the real game. Tell me, human, can you drive a scarab? This would lead into some gameplay. And th the cool gameplay, of course, is the, the Arbiter riding on the, the scarab tank while Johnson was driving it. They're gonna know we're coming. This is the scene that used to be called the mural scene, and you're about to see why. This is our big chance in the middle of the game to give the player a really clear understanding of the Covenant religion, explain how they're, it's actually set up, what they believe in, and why. I think the original videomatic that we're looking at, it probably gave the player too much information. I think we were trying to sell the Covenant side of the story a little bit too hard. What has happened? The prophets blame us for that braggart regret's demise and decided to replace our best warriors with these imbeciles. But I think the cool thing, if you look at the real cinematic in the game, the one that evolved from this, we picked the most important things, which were the changing of the guard, the relationship, the uneasy relationship between the Spec Ops commander and the Prophets, and then the sort of conniving way that the Prophet of Truth gets the player, the Arbiter, excited about going and, and completing his task, those sort of three critical moments are still in the real cinematic, but they're done much more, much more efficiently. This is kind of the, the very beginning of the realization that the, the Covenant is starting to fall apart, where the, the elites are kind of being ushered off to the side by the prophets, and, and the brutes are kind of coming in, and, and nobody really knows what's going on. The Spec Ops commander's like, I don't know why we're being kicked out. It was clear the elites could no longer guarantee our safety. But we have always been your protectors. These are trying times for all of us. We have this fantastic story arc that we're trying to get across, and we have all this backstory that we're trying to get across. And there comes a point where we look at the amount of time that we have left to finish this game, and we realize that we're just crazy. We're not going to be able to do all of this. And so we pick our battles with you know, what we can cut out. And essentially, we're not losing that much by the cinematic that replaces what you see here. How well do you know the writ of union? As well as I did the day I swore my oath. Recite the first canto. So full of hate we're our eyes that none of us could see. Our war would yield countless dead but never victory. So let us cast arms aside and like discard our wrath. Thou in faith will keep us safe whilst we find the path. Hungry for power and dominion, our ancestors met on the field of battle. Indeed, I suspect we would still be at each other's throats had the prophets not found evidence of the forerunners and their great journey. The murals on the wall, essentially they walk you through the seven stages of the formation of the Covenant um, from the earliest time when the elites and the prophets were actually mortal enemies and fighting each other up to the sort of present day where both species in conjunction with a you know, handful of others, grunts, etc., are actually 
looking for the halo ring. So as you look at the first mural, you'll see it's a representation of the conflict between the prophets and the elites. And this one shows uh, sort of the elite's function in the covenant, which is as the enforcers. While some were short-sighted and chose to reject the promise of our union, all were eventually swayed by the knowledge that those who joined the covenant would be welcome on our great journey. This one here shows uh, the, what the prophets do, which is essentially search through old foreigner ruins and find artifacts. And one of the most amazing things they found as they searched was this myth of seven rings created by the forerunners scattered throughout the galaxy. And this myth of the rings became the thing which uh, drove, the, the, um, drove the creation of the covenant is the, the, the foundation of their religion, which is a belief that these rings are sacred objects that will, if activated, make you a god. For an instant, our Lord's most splendid creation revealed its hidden power, a divine wind that would rush through the stars. I think that there's a great push in games these days to throw everything in first person and to essentially remove any letterbox cinematic time. I think a lot of people are moving in that direction. I think our job is to, as efficiently as possible, bracket in letterboxes those critical things the player has to know and tell them in a way that's epic and moving that you just can't always do in first person. But we don't want to keep the player in this little rarefied special world too long. We want to give him some questions, give him some answers, but then send him back out into the sandbox. So this is a great example of a six minute thing that we decided, you know, we can really do this in about four or three and a half or maybe even less than that. And let's take that other stuff and let's sprinkle it around in all the different levels. And I think ultimately the player um, not just appreciates that more, but it makes it a richer game experience. I'm Robert McLeese. Mainly, I, I make guns. My name is Marcus Leto. I am the art director for Halo 2. My name is Shikai Wang, and uh, I'm a conceptual artist for Halo 2. Look, it's the... Blind, blind wolf. wolf. <laughs> the beloved blind wolf. That was back when you could ride it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could actually mount the thing and ride it. Ride it. AI couldn't uh, couldn't handle it on the AI side. Couldn't flock them. Couldn't uh, fit them into gameplay. Oh, it's nothing on our end. No. It's always no. the program. We had side. it all. Hey, the Drenal. Hey. Yeah, Drenal yeah. was a big deal. The Hulk. Hulk. Giant. Um, boss character. And we'd always thought uh, the Covenant kept this thing, you know, all tied up and, and yeah. enraged. Right. And it would bring it out during uh, the frontline battle. It would have been a cool I boss think, character. I, yeah, yeah, I think he was just too damn big. Yeah. Good vehicle smasher, it would have been good. Yeah. That was the, the special purpose yeah. sniper guy, right? We wanted, like, uh, him to have uh, his arms used as, like, a tripod. And he can actually flip left to right, like, side to side, so without having to yeah. And switch weapons or something. We had him silly. being able to hang from trees as well and do some weird, weird yeah. stuff like that. He got Ooh. pretty far too. We actually textured him and got into the game instead. Mm -hmm. Just it took that long to figure out that. Yeah. He's <laughs> a piece of crap. This is the engineer. We got this into the game. It's actually fully modeled, one. textured. Yeah. It was a technical, technological savvy character that would rip apart. Uh, technology and, and uh, it savant. Yeah. consume it for the Covenant. This is probably the weirdest character what I've seen hell? in our sketchbook. Marcus said we needed a character that was more menacing because every one of our characters looked too We needed something -like. more monster-like. Yeah. Monster -like. We were just trying to go have a, a physique <laughs> that's like biped, but doesn't behave <laughs> like a biped. So you have all these parts that are missing and all these limbs that are extra limbs. Uh, oh, this guy's cool. I, I like this guy. He was supposed to carry his weapon under his belly. Beginnings oh. of the hunter, I think. Hey, there you go, Rob. It's the uh, what gator, was it? Doberman. Some Doberman gator or the <laughs> <don't> gator? The do <laughs> uh, yeah. And then the keel bug. Keel bug. Which was my idea for cleaning up bodies on the battlefield. It would fl uh, a few of them would fly in and cut the body into sections and fly off. I like the wing where it actually distorts. It made them. no sense. Oh. That's cool. I think it was a strike fighter, right? It was strike like a defensive fighter, fighter for the uh, the the right. Earth space. 
Well, it just didn't fit into our gameplay either. We didn't have, oh, yeah. We yeah, didn't have a like purpose a, for this kind of thing. Well, that's cinematics. Yeah, it'd be a cinematic only thing. We needed more of a Black Hawk type vehicle, which also got dropped. Dude, I, I so wanted this vehicle to get into the game. The doozy. Precursor to the doozy. Yeah. Um, this didn't make any sense. Didn't that thing eventually wind up getting a gun on the back of it, or? Uh, no, no, we were two going, people, got, one gun in the uh, front, right. one in the back. And then, one guy facing backwards. Yeah. The nausea seat. Yeah. Hovercraft were kind of a strange thing back then, especially uh, ones that we needed to remain stationary at a certain altitude. That We had a very difficult time with some of those. It would have taken a long time for us to uh, tune the uh, engine physics to make it work right. Oh, man, this is Mongoose. The ATV. Yeah, I got cut. We had weapons on the front of it initially. We tried no weapons. The designers couldn't figure out how to integrate it into gameplay. It didn't work in conjunction with vehicles like the Warthog or the Ghost. This broke the model too much. Can't tune it well enough, so we had to cut it out. This is disappointing, isn't it? Yeah, this yeah. Is. We've tried so hard to get this thing into the game. We had effects, model, we even reiterated it. Yeah. Rob yeah. did for uh, Halo 2. We built it. The most difficult model to build that I, that I did in Halo was the most difficult rebuild for Halo 2. Yep. <laughs> Looked beautiful, too. Sure, it sucks. Yeah, it's all this good stuff we want to get into the game, but, you know, that's uh, part of making games. No, we're gonna start this far back. So are those like newer guys or are those the old guys? Those are the no, super old like oh, those are the old guys. guys. Hey, that looks like, like the back of my dog. Okay, so this is Sheik, Rob, and Paul, and Marty making sound effects. Now we're out on the road? Who thought this was gonna be cool? <laughs> <laughs> like Just, oh yeah, oh well God. of yeah. course, that because that's what it was. This is this is dance. Engine. And there's like one of the old busted up bunkers. Now was that made that's out of like igloo beautiful. blocks? No, I think it was just busted up. Okay. Is Loading. that the Hummer? And the Hummer? Yeah, the Hummer. That's the first uh version of uh, the Warthog, I guess, huh? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The and there's yeah. the old version of the Ghost. Yes, yeah, so the one right to the left corner in the gray, right next to the Jeep. What year is this now? This is uh, 1948, 98, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seriously, this is what, 1990? This is 98. Hey, we, tell, cool. we had detail objects back then? What wow. detail objects are you talking there, look about? Look on the ground, see? <laughs> ah, the beginning. Oh, they all broken here. Oh, the broken yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Track. That's a little prelude to what happens in the future. Oh, see, that's oh, the, old, the Warthog. Oh, man, like, the old like stealth the tank that we never got in the uh, game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, the guy still has the assault rifle across his shoulders. Yeah, that still no. looks cool, man. I don't know why anybody says that, that, that still looks idea. cool. Mm. So that looks like a Warthog. Yeah, yeah. it's a Warthog. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the textures are so low res. I mean, that's cool, you know. Yeah, yeah I think we're using 128s or something yeah. at that point. Whoa. That people probably want to know why we switched from third person to first person. Because Jason... Uh, well, he was the one that was dead set like against like. first person for a long yeah, time. Yeah, and then right? he's like, hey, wait, we can't make third person work. Hey, let's change it back. That's, <laughs> that's what happens when your lead is a crack addict. Oh, dang. <laughs> that was Paul Russell, former Bungie employee. <laughs> <laughs> The Here's control the, the room. old control room. Yeah. The, yeah, boy, I have a sense of awe. Dude, this is cool. Oh, what? what's up at the? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, this, this is the first, first time we the had a mirror. Mirror, right? mirror. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Here we go. Macro. This is macro. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh man. <laughs> so we actually tried to play uh, multiplayer on this thing with third person once, and then it's just uh, impossible. It just turned people. into a like grenade juggling act. Yeah, just because you just can't. You can't <laughs> aim for crap. Yeah. Now, does that, yeah, that actually had, like, the disintegrating belt. It created, like, twice as many particles as it oh, really? really needed to yeah. Oh, that was nice. Yeah. Yeah, I remember we had a couple of transitionings between the exterior hey, yeah. control control. and the interior. Yeah. Let's look at all the... It's getting close. Hologram thing. What happens when you paint it? <laughs> yeah, look at that hologram. Wow. Yeah, none of this stuff yeah, ever got ever, used in the original ones. Uh oh! Oh, this is closer. actually had the map up in the upper. Mm. Oh, this is this is the E three one. This E three. E three two thousand. Yep. This is still PC though. There. Yes. Yeah. And you know, I kind of like the old ones where the reflection maps weren't circular. It was just planar. It was cooler. Boy, that's when the artist knew how to draw skies though. Um, I feel moist. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I feel the cannon off the bat, good. <laughs> we would have had like 30 different guns in that thing. That's right. If yeah. It would have been up to me. Yeah. Yeah. Go into water. Go into water. Well, you know, I'm it's like, go into water. It's Microsoft. I know. By the way, you only have five months to make your game. Well, so. it was either that or never release it and yeah. then uh, go no, no, for no. other jobs. 
All right, man, here we are. Yeah. Everybody out. Yeah. yeah. As you can tell, there's no AI at all. Everything was scripted in E3. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you saying E3 was smoking me? We outsourced it to uh, a post-production house. To Henson. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, wow. Yeah, yeah there's the old the alien sniper rifle, the plasma oh, sniper rifle. Yeah. Here's the old AR. Oh, oh, oh. oh and here's the, the anti-air rocket launcher. Oh, it's got that magic pocket that can fill up with anything. Yeah, there it goes. It doesn't oh, explode. Yeah. There's the pistol. Look at all the cool weapons we have. There's before. the uh, the anti-armor yeah. rocket. How much do we get to keep from all this? Like five. Which one is that? That's that's the, the shotgun. Yeah. Oh, shotgun. Yeah, it's all right. Ah, uh, the SMG. <laughs> Holy! SMG. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> nice effect. It's a is fire hazard. <laughs> what? This is it? What? This is it? <laughs> Bet you can't stick it. Here is the space station. I think the main gist of what we were trying to achieve with this mm -hmm. uh, at the very, very beginning was the idea of this giant perimeter gun that orbits the Earth and is used for satellite defense. One thing I really liked about the space station was uh, how you could actually really have a sense of where you were in the station with all the windows looking out onto the gun, like all these atrium spaces where you've got a lot of sight lines to other parts of the station that you later get to. Unlike the Pillar of Autumn, you really didn't have a sense of how big the structure was. That leads us onto Old Mombasa. We had a lot of destruction present in this to really try to set the mood of the Earth being under attack. It was sort of uh, an inspiration of what would an old ethnic neighborhood look like in the future. So a lot of stuff has been retrofitted with wires and it was a nice way to transitions into the newer architecture, which you eventually get to after you play through the beach and the tunnels and all that. And you eventually end up uh, over what we call New Mombasa. A lot of the look and feel of the city was based on either concepts that were painted or from actual photographs of the current city of Mombasa that exists in Kenya. And so that's why it seems familiar at the same time. We've tried to add as simply as possible signs of 500 years of human advance. It, it sort of still harkens to the arcology concept that Chris Lee was yeah. working on a long time ago for the E3. You'll so, see a lot of architecture here, like this large bridge. There's some highway sections and then the new city. And the reason why the arcology was replaced is because it was such a massive structure that you really felt like you were just in a gray metal canyon and not in a living city uh, nearly as much as, as the new level so hopefully it was a change for the better cast giant dave's baby is big <laughs> worked on this big for baby too long too many <laughs> years it was satisfying to play through and i played through it today and i think successfully the production half of it feels like okay this is where they're moving these odd canisters full of gas that they're farming i think there's a good transition from that to the research area where this was this predates the halos the idea for this was this is where they first sort of came into contact with the flood and had this horrible potential war in front of them or uh, in the station. Okay, here we go. Sentinel Wall. This is where things start to cook up story-wise. This wall was built by the forerunners to keep the flood quarantined into a specific area on a Delta Halo. Even the exterior of the, the quarantine zone is supposed to reflect the, the barrenness and the lack of life that the uh, Sentinels have been trying to instill in the area by starving it of light and energy and heat and all sorts of good things, since that's why it's so cold. And we're now at High Charity. We definitely took a departure from uh, the Covenant stuff that we did in Halo. We're able to squeeze the most out of the Xbox and actually do all the fancy curves and shiny surfaces that we had drawn out. We chose a different palette for colors. Um, yes, purple. A lot darker. Much darker purple than much desaturated. Darker purple, <laughs> desaturated. More mauve tones bit, of yeah. yellow orange. We pulled off a much better organic feel to everything, uh, which was really, really kind of neat. So the lighting is going to be very dark and moody. So yeah. now we're looking at the Delta Halo. It's really cool. It has a lot of beautiful water shots. I think some of our the really good uh, overgrowth throughout all of it. So. Yeah, we definitely put a lot more attention onto making forerunner structures look like they've actually aged. First game, they were pretty spick and span. It's somewhat reminiscent of the first control room in, in terms of its sort of the ziggurat structure that Chris Barrett did in Halo 1. We wanted to relate to that in the spherical room shape, or the control room shape, but unearthed it a lot more. I think this is really where we, we hit our stride because the sheer scope and scale of all these levels. And they're huge. They're huge. 